next speaker, Brother Ralph Rucker, has been a good friend for a good number of years. I think, Ralph, I must have met you when you were at Marlin when I first moved here and have got to know him more as the years have gone by and we're deeply appreciative of uh, the work that he has done. Ralph and his wife Janice have four children and 10 grandchildren. He graduated from ACU, UTPB, and the Brown Trust School of Preaching. Before he began preaching, he worked for the New Mexico Health and Environment Department. He's preached for the congregations in Texas, New Mexico, and Wyoming. And he presently serves as evangelist with the Hilltown Church of Christ near Santa Fe, Tennessee. We want to hear him speak to us now on the church in transition. If you'll come do that, we'll be most happy. Thank you, Brother David. It's my honor to be here today with you. Uh, love this congregation very much. And I appreciate the invitation you've given me over the years to come and speak with you. And the, the, especially on behalf of my family, I want to thank the, the brethren here for supporting, helping support us the last year. We appreciate that very much. You know, I was told once that the late brother Tom Warren was asked, uh, Brother Warren, how did you survive all those seminaries that you went to? I know you went to Vanderbilt and, and also uh, Southwest Baptist Theological Seminary and probably some others. How did you survive all that? Now, why didn't you lose your faith like so many others have? For example, Rubel Shelley. And I was told that he replied, I question everything that was said. And you know what I know, Brother Brown, that's a true statement because Dave Miller told me that 20 years ago. So I know that's true. But you know, I thought about that statement when I was reading this book. This book, and I have it right here, and I have read this thing almost three times. Couldn't make it through the third time. But almost three times. But when I read this book, that's what I thought of. Because it is a very slick book, a very diplomatic, and even, you might even stretch it and say, biblically oriented book. But you know, brethren, the Bible, rather the devil, can be diplomatic. He can be persuasive. Just as 3 verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more subtle, subtle than all the beasts of the field which the Lord had made. Too many brethren, when they read books like this, they try to remain open-minded. You know, we all want to be open-minded. But they're so open-minded, their brain falls out. And they don't look at what's being said. This book has an appendix which has four articles, which in many ways are kind of a rehash of what he said in the main part of the book. And that also has a laboriously long poem by someone named John Carroll Brown, entitled A Day, A Dream of Judgment. And Rolf Langley Ruffner didn't want to evaluate what John Carroll Brown said, but anyway, uh, let's look at this book a little bit this morning. If you look at this book, this fellow is just another change agent. He's very smooth and sophisticated about all this. His concern, supposedly heartfelt about the Church of Christ, is really just skin deep. He uh, relates a series of what I call epiphanies which turned him from being a, quote, traditional member of the church to a liberal member of the church. Now, where have we heard that before? Every change agent over the last 30 years, or 30 years or so, they've all been to the mountaintop. They've all had some great experience. It's all changed their mind. But you know, the Lord himself said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. They're ravening wolves. We must never forget that. Brother Woodruff, James S. Woodruff, is no different. Jeremiah 6, verse 16, I think, sums it up best, where it says, Thus saith the Lord, stand you in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way and walk therein and you shall find rest in your souls. 
and they said, we will not walk therein. Brethren liberals always decry, degrade, dismiss the old paths. They want their own paths. The broad path that leads us to damnation, Matthew chapter 7. That's why this book is so deceptive. He comes forth and says, well, you know, this is a needed book. Well, someone mentioned this morning, we already have the Bible. <laughs> that was needed. <laughs> but this is a needed book. And he's saying, you know, I, I could have written this a long time ago. But I've worked, me and others have worked on it. And, you know, the Church of Christ in, in America is not in good health. And that was 20 years ago. I guess we're on terminal now status. And he says, you know, uh, you know we, we'll, we need to do a mid-course correction. We need to change our attitude about everything so we, the ship can stay afloat. And, you know, there's this extreme to the church. You have the traditionalists, and by that he means those that want to stick with the Bible. And then the opposite, those churches which have cut loose from the entanglement of traditionalism. And he says, oh, we need, of course, you know where he is. He's right there in the middle. Well, as they used to say in Texas, at least, the only thing in the middle of the road is dead armadillos and yellow lines. And that's where he is. Oh, we need to do that. We need to, and, you know, and guess who can, uh, you know, he, guess who can lead us out of that? Why, well, he can. He says, I'm a third-generation Christian with 37 years of ministry. I guess he's qualified to act as Moses. Get us out of the wilderness, sir, wherever. Well, you know, brethren, I'm a fourth, and may, I think I am maybe even farther than that generation Christian, which doesn't matter <laughs> either way. I'm thankful for that, but that uh, doesn't, doesn't save you. But anyway, and I've heard this before. I've heard brethren say for two generations, oh, the sky is falling. The sky is falling. You know, Rubel Shelley, Lynn Anderson, oh, the church has got to change or die. I believe one brother pointed that out this morning. Change or die. We've got to do it. Well, that was 20 years ago when he did this, 1991. 20 years ago. But this brother is a little bit more diplomatic than a lot of Rubel Shelley or Lynn Anderson. And, but you know, they forget something. Jesus purchased the church with his own blood, Acts 20, verse 28. It's something precious to him. It's the, his body, his bride. And it will last until the Lord returns. And to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21. God doesn't change. Malachi chapter 1, verse 3, verse 6 tells us. Why should the church change? Why should the church change? Why doesn't Woodruff change? Why doesn't other apostates change? Why don't all of them, and even some that call themselves conservative, why don't they bow before Jesus and say, my Lord and my God, and change? Because the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, tells us that someday we will stand before that great white throne. If we haven't done it in this life, we will then say that Jesus is Lord. Why not change now? Why not go back to the Bible? Get rid of all this foolishness, all this sophistry and intellectual snobbishness that you read about, or theological snobbishness, whatever. But you know, that shows the very nature of these books, and especially Brother Woodruff's book. It has a stealth agenda. Back in the 1990s, and still true today, many liberals within the Brotherhood, they had an agenda. Not only one that did they want to change the church, they wanted to, of course, they wouldn't say this, but they want us to fellowship with everybody that if we can. But especially they want a fellowship, they chose the independent Christian church. 
Oh, we can fellowship with them. And that's what this brother does. All through his book, very di diplomatically, he weaves that idea that, you know, if you use the mechanical instrument of music, if you use that piano, that guitar, that bongo drum, that's, that's a minor infraction. That's no big deal. And, but then he shifts over to the other side and he says, well, I'm a non-instrumentalist. Page 138. You know, I thought about this after I wrote this manuscript. What is the instrument we use when we pr sing praises to God? Ephesians 5, 19, our heart. So we're not non-instrumentalists, are we, in that sense? But anyway, he says, he said, I'm a non-instrumentalist. But you know, this issue about the instrument, about mechanical instruments and music, is not worth dividing over. So we've got to unite. But he never comes out and says that, per se. He never comes out and tells the, the whole truth of the matter. He just keeps you guessing. <clears throat> he goes on in his book, and he proclaims very, tries to come out very solidly that he is a biblical person. He says, we are a people of the book. But then he goes on and criticizes us for, in a sense, being too biblical. He says, there is a longing for a biblical basis upon which to accept one another. For too long we have searched for a basis of rejecting those who differ with us. It is now time, past time, to search diligently for a biblical basis for accept, accepting them. He says we've got to get away from legalism, extreme legalism. I don't know, I guess there's legalism and then there's extreme legalism. But anyway, and what does he point? He says, oh, there's a great hunger for unity. And he points to the 1986 Abilene lectures where you would probably starve to death spiritually if you went to. Something called the Kimachi Clinic, and that's not in Japan, that's in Oklahoma, by the way put out by the Independent Christian Church, <clears throat> the Tulsa Soul Damning Wet Workshop, 1990. Mentions all those, it mentions the, the Image Magazine, the Firm Foundation Under Rural Lemons, the Restoration Review, One Body, Mission Messenger, all these are examples, all these, all these brethren are clamoring for unity. Just we've gotta have it. I recall some of that so-called clamoring, and it always involved you surrender you surrender to us. You surrender what you believe in, and you accept what we do. But you know, I can't ever find in this book right here, Old or the New Testament, where God was ever pleased when his people tolerated false doctrine, man-made tradition. You can't find it. You go back in the Old Testament, the nation of Judah, do you think any of their neighbors surrendered those idols? No. They didn't surrender their idols for the sake of unity. Not even Ahab would do that. To this present hour, the Christian church still has that golden idol up there, that mechanical instrument of music. And they still are, are holding on to it very tightly and say, oh, you need to accept what we do. That's how you have unity. And in chapter two, Brother Woodruff talks about a supposed epiphany he had in the 1960s when he was a missionary in New Zealand. Said he went all there all, all gun-ho and ready to go and it, he, uh, pretty soon he faced the wall that many missionaries face, you know, the people are, it's, it's a hard nut to crack. And he realized what? His message was wrong. You know, here this great flash he has, I'm not emphasizing Jesus enough. I want you to listen to this very carefully. This amazed me in the whole book. I think this is one statement that really threw me. If following Jesus Christ should mean that I would die and go to hell, if he were there also, that's all I would ask. Give me a break. That's got to be one of the most, as they say, subjectivism gone to seed. Unbiblical statement that there is. But you know, some people, brother, they will read that and say, oh, isn't that wonderful? He would go to hell if Jesus was there. 
So he has this epiphany, and he, he says, you know, I've been pre not emphasizing Jesus enough, and he says, you know, that's like the restoration movement. He said uh, that the church, he says, is part of, he said, you know, we're taking the same path that Ezra and the ancient Jews do. Of course, you've read about Ezra, helped to restore the worship of the temple there in Jerusalem, helped to rebuild the temple. Nehemiah actually, uh, uh, Zerubbabel did that, and Ezra helped restore the worship. And uh, he says, why, we all know they became the Pharisees generations later. Well, how does he know that? That's a supposition at best. And he says, you know, there's four areas. Because of that, we, we don't want to become Pharisees. We need to reevaluate, or re rather reflect, reevaluate, reform. He says, number one, we're too enamored with the living word, with the, uh, pardon me, the written word, rather than the living word, Jesus Christ. You know, we're just too enamored with the, with the Bible. You know, it's interesting that Jesus, when he condemned the Pharisees, did not condemn them for following the Bible, for, 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 for following the law, but forsaking the law and following their traditions. Notice Mark chapter 7, verse 9. He said unto them, For well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition. In verse 13, Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such things, like things ye do. It's amazing that people would think that Jesus said, Well, you, you need to give up the, the law here so you can do something else. And another point he says under this idea, he says, we are preoccupied with Aristotle's logic and Scottish philosophy. Of course, we've already talked quite a bit about that. He said, it's only brought confusion and division. Brethren, and I think Brother Hightower has pointed this out sometime in conversations I've had with him. He said, you know, people that surrender logic for the subjective is because they can't answer logically framed inquiries. They can't answer it, so they just surrender them. Logic doesn't cause division. The lack of correct reasoning, logic, when approaching the Bible, can cause division. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman need not be ashamed, brightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. You know, Brother Woodruff, logophobia, Fear of logic can be cured. Fear of correct reason can be cured. Woodruff goes on and says, our reactionary theology is doctrine exalting rather than Christ exalting. That means you cannot criticize or, or, or uh, explain to someone they are lost in error. You can't do that because that's not exalting Christ. You know, that's strange. You read over in Acts chapter 19, when Paul corrected those disciples of John at Ephesus, do you think he was exalting Christ? Yes, he was exalting Christ. When James corrected his Judaizing brethren in Acts chapter 15 about their false doctrine, wasn't he exalting Christ? Every time we, with love, seek to correct false doctrine, we are exalting Christ. Why? Because Jesus is the author of truth. John chapter 8, 31 and 32. And he goes on and he says, We have majored too much in effect material in the Bible. Now what's he talking about there? That means the book of, of Acts and the epistles. And uh, not enough in the cause material in the Bible. The gospel accounts. It all boils down to, would you think we preach too much on baptism? The necessity of baptism. Now here, I think Woodruff reveals something about himself that didn't, doesn't tend to. Woodruff does not believe in the verbal, plenary inspiration of the Bible, the epistles as well as the gospels. And I believe that's the logical deduction from his, what he's offered us here in his arguments. Brethren, is Galatians any less important to the spiritual well-being of a soul than the gospel of Mark? Are they, are they not both scripture? Are they not part of the whole counsel of God? Acts 20, verse 27. So the author says, oh, we've been emphasizing the Bible too much. 
at least the parts he likes. We haven't been exalting Christ. So we need to change the slogan that so many brethren have used where it says, go back to the Bible, now it's go back to the Gospels. Now what happens when you do that? We have a whole generation where we can look at and see what's happened about that. Many brethren congregations have done that now. They are spiritually malnourished, and they could not give you book, chapter, and verse for anything they do, and they sure couldn't give, uh, define the one body, the one Lord, one faith, one baptism, Ephesians chapter 4. It's a lost generation. Woodruff goes on chapter 4, and he tells him, he says, you know, the, tells us, he says, churches need to change, and he begins to explain why. He says, we need to be a church of transition, just like the early church. And he goes back to Acts chapter 10 and 11, where there the Lord uh, adds the first Gentiles, Cornelius and his household, to the body of Christ. Now, I agree with Brother Woodruff on a point here. Yes, this time was a traumatic time in the early church. You read Acts chapter 15. This was no, to borrow Brother Chumley here, it was no tea and crumpets. When they, when they got together, uh, Paul and Barnabas and the apostles and elders in Jerusalem and the Judaizers, there was some discussion, there was some argumentation. See, the Jew, some of the Jewish Christians had brought in the baggage of the law and the pharisaical traditions. And it would be a while before all this was settled in. They understood everything. But that's where my agreement ends. Because the church dilemma today is not the dilemma they faced. The brethren who opposed the addition of the Gentiles and the rejection of the law of Moses were opposing God himself. They didn't change because the church was a dying institution. You know, I don't know anyone today, any faithful brethren, who have cultural baggage like that. You know, they, they would be willing to make changes and, and say, you know, if we uh, were in a culture where they didn't have pews that sat on the floor, as they do in India many times, there's no problem with that. But see, there's a difference here. Back then, in Acts chapter 10, 11, in Acts chapter 15, they did not have the final revelation of God. The church was not yet completely the structure was not completed. The scaffolding, which I believe was the miraculous gifts, was all around it. God was building the church, helping to build it up. It was still in flux. That's why Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 10, but that when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be not away. We don't need a new revelation today that says, oh, you need to change. But that's what this brother needs. He needs a new revelation. Because he's not going to get it out of the old one. And he goes on with various arguments. He says, but a church which decides to be involved in spreading the new good news about Christ over the earth must decide to be a church in transition. And he gives on some very weird accounts, in my opinion. He talks back in the 19, 1998 that a Lutheran minister in communist Eastern Europe, and I assume this is what, East Germany, immersed 200 adults in an icy river. And he was asked why he didn't follow the Lutheran tradition and sprinkle them and so forth. He said, in times like these, only the essential survives. And all Woodruff think this is the indispensable argument. We need to get rid of all our cultural baggage and only keep that which is essential. And he talks about a and he, uh, he talked missionary in France who imported unfermented grape juice to use in the Lord's Supper. Oh, he thought, I imagine he thought that was hilarious. Or about, and then another example was the Christian church missionaries in Africa who decided not to use the organ in their revival because it was too unwieldy, not because it was unauthorized and unscriptural, but it was too unwieldy. And then he goes and uh, says, oh, we need to be more exclu inclusive here. We need to uh, get rid of this cultural baggage. Be like Thomas Campbell. And brother, uh, the brother talked on that this, uh, yesterday did a be much better job brother Vaughn and I could do on this where brother Campbell Thomas Campbell at the beginning of his process of getting out of denominationalism 
said these, it talked about inference and deduction, how we shouldn't uh, bind that on anyone and things like that. And Woodruff says, oh, that's all I'm asking. That's all I'm asking. They just choose one statement here made years before and say, this is it. You know, this brother needs to be more Christ exalting in his arguments. As the brethren point out repeatedly, the Lord used logic and correct reasoning over and over and over again. The, the gospel accounts are full of that. Our Lord was a stickler for details. You know, if he had taken this brother's advice and says, well, let's only keep what's essential. Think what he could have done. He would have said, you know, I'm going to include the Gentiles in the kingdom anyway. I'll just uh, uh, put a Gentile in as a, an apostle. Shake everything up. Or I'll just not answer any of the questions of the Pharisees. They're, gone, they're lost anyway. I'm not going to fool with them. Or why did the Lord, if, you know, if things, we had to hang on to only what is essential, why did the Lord require those, command those that, are he, that were healed of leprosy to go and present themselves at the temple in Jerusalem and offer the sacrifices and so forth? Matthew chapter 8, verse 1 through 4. Why? The Lord faithfully kept the law. Luke 24, verse 44. These words what I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. How do you determine what's essential in Christianity? You stick your finger in the air and see where the wind blows? You go look at some, some book about change? What do you do that? You rightly divide the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. Howbeit when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. Jesus said, told the apostles. Woodruff goes on and he tries to find a parallel between the early Christians there in Acts chapter 10 11 and the 20th century church of Christ. He says, you know, we're like them, we're too elitist. And he, he says this, says, no, Lord, we never accept religious people who were not like us. And he goes on and, and shows how he dabbled in ecumenism, tells how he, uh, at the request of a youth minister from Florida College, which is an Annie Orphan's Home College in Florida, he said he, he once collaborated with him and, and went out and spoke to his youth group. I mean, he's real proud of himself told how he was speaking at the Texas A&M Church of Christ, and he had a kind of an epiphany. He had earlier had uh, worked with a, uh, there, when he was out there with a uh, independent Christian church preacher and loaned him some Jewel Miller film strips or something like that. He says, you know, I can bring, I need, we need to bring peace between these two men. Like God brought peace, Jesus rather brought peace between the Jews and Gentiles. And he makes, here's his epiphany here. He says, I want to go on record this morning and I want you to hear me witness that I fully intend, God being my helper, to spend the rest of my life preaching peace as Jesus did and bring, being a peacemaker as he was. I intend to spend the rest of my life building bridges and not walls. How noble. He says, you know, we're too preoccupied with doctrinal purity instead of fostering peace. It's fuel war. Now, who's the villain in all that? Brethren are. Traditional brethren. Conservative brethren. We're the villains. Well, you know, he dig, needs to dig a little deeper into that idea. What was the basis of that peace that Jesus offered in Acts chapter 10? We read in chapter 34, 35. It says, then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Notice that. First, we must have peace with God. He that feareth him and worketh righteousness. Then we can have peace with man. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when does that happen? When does God break down that middle wall of partition between us? Ephesians 2, verse 14. Bible's own best commentary when we are baptized into Christ. Galatians 3, verse 26, 28. There's no more Jew and Greek. Bond and free. They're all one in Christ Jesus. 
Well, you know, our religious neighbors in the Christian church, conservative or not, our Baptist friends, our Assembly of God neighbors, they don't have peace with God yet. They have not obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered you, Romans 6, verse 17. For example, in the Christian church, they've not obeyed the doctrine concerning worship, authorized worship, missionary societies, women elders, women deacons, open membership, and a slew of other things. You know, they're not in Christ, Ephesians 1, verse 3. The Gentiles in Paul's day, many of them at least, were not, they were not Christians, were strangers from the covenant of promise for that without Christ, Ephesians 2, verse 12. How can we be in fellowship with someone that Christ is not in fellowship with? Him, with? When Paul found that group at Ephesus, John's disciples who had been baptized for the remission of sins, Mark 1, verse 4, he straightened them out. He had them repent, and they were baptized in Christ. They obeyed the gospel. Colossians, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteous with unrighteous, and what communion hath light with darkness? Woodruff goes on and describes this, again, this how to reach this idea of unity in the midst of diversity. I don't know if he coined that word, but he used it quite a bit. He said, you know, uh, there was uh, the, the Jews and the Gentiles, they united in the early church. We can unite in spite of our doctrinal differences. He says, be sure of one thing. This is page 115. Diversity is part of God's plan. It's here to stay. The question confronting us is, what are we going to do with diversity? And he goes to nature, the supposed harmony of nature. And then he goes to uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where it talks about the members of the human body, that the, the members of the church should work together in harmony. He says, oh, that means we can, we can overcome our, we can have unity in the midst of diversity. There's God's plan for us. We can work out our differences. Even it's, if it's the use of unauthorized worship. But you know what Paul was talking about in context in that passage? He was talking about the use and the misuse of miraculous gifts of the Spirit. He wasn't talking about doctrinal differences. <coughs> Imagine a congregation that's, that practice what Woodruff preaches. Say you've got one group that believes that you can divorce for any reason and get remarried for any reason. Just believes that and teaches that. And then you have another group that believes what the Bible says, Matthew chapter 19, verse 9. You only one scripture reason for divorce, and that being fornication with only the innocent party in the divorce having the right to remarry. Now, if you take Woodruff's view, then we all got to agree to disagree. The love conquers all. Got to get along. Doesn't that sound familiar? There are congregations throughout this land that have forsaken biblical love and unity for, as one man put it, the mere association of mutual acquaintance. Acquaintances. Or you mutual acquaintances. And what does that involve? That involves those that believe the Bible. They either surrender or leave. We must. We must be mutually submissive to the will of Christ or we must separate. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 18 and 19. Then... Woodruff goes to what is the, really the sugar stick of a lot of liberals, and that's Romans chapter 14, where uh, th this is how you accept change. Where, and let's, I'll just read quickly what he says here. These two chapters view Romans, these two chapters view Romans 14, 1 through 15, verse 7, and that's talking about Acts chapter 10, verse 11. As the Spirit's attempt to give legitimacy to the adversity occasioned by the event in Cornelius' home, but there is a more detailed treatment of this subject of unity and diversity found in the Roman letter, chapters 14 and 15. I've often said that this chapter, Romans 14 and 15, is the Spirit's attempt to clean up the mess caused by the events of Acts 10 and 11. Now, there's only one problem with that. Well, many problems, but one comes to mind. 
in Romans 14 and then into 15, it doesn't mention the Gentiles. It mentions the eating or the not eating of meat. Not accepting of doctrinal differences. And the mess, that's a terrible use of a term there, that Woodruff claims the Holy Spirit caused in Acts 10 that was cleaned up in chapter 14. The Holy Spirit already dealt with that in Acts chapter 15 in that letter that was sent out by the apostles and the elders to the churches. Now think about it. This, this idea of unity in the midst of diversity. You can look in the denominational world for a perfect example of that. I don't know if you've followed, and I know Brother Chumley's followed some of this, the Episcopal Church in the United States that is having a civil war within themselves over the idea of the acceptance of unrepentant homosexuals as priests and bishops. And the one side is very pious and, oh, we need to accept, we need to have unity and diversity. We need to have di dialogue here and accept these people. Other denominations have done the same thing. They're, the liberals within them have demanded that you accept these unrepentant practicing homosexuals. What's the difference between what that says and what Woodruff is preaching? Nothing. Nothing. And then he goes on and talks about brothers in error. The, the Jesus fellowship Jews that were in sin or in doctrinal error, oh yeah, he did eat with folks that were tax collectors and, uh, and publicans and sinners, but he did it to teach them. He probably told them what they told the woman at the well, go and sin, or rather the woman caught in the act of adultery, John 8, 11, go and sin no more. See, again, Woodruff's Interpretation degrades the inspiration of the Bible. For example, he says, the domino perspective of truth views all scripture, all truth, as of equal importance or value. If, we, if one part of the scripture is breached, it is as serious as if all were breached. He disagrees with that. He says it's all, you know, you, one part is more important than any other. Well, does that make what James said in James 2 verse 8 about the royal law of love does that supersede what Paul said about in Romans 16, verse 17, to mark those which cause divisions and, and uh, offenses contrary to doctrine which you have learned and avoid them? Of course not. That's a faulty hermeneutic, does that. And he says, oh, we need to, we need to work on in, the internal issues rather than the external. We need to have the bullseye. Reach for the bullseye here. Don't worry about those little naggy little things out there that like instrumental music. In fact, he has a, even a list of all the things we divide over and he talks about one cup and this and that and right in the middle is there instruments of music. Instruments of music. That's the bullseye of his agenda. It's a change of song. Well, brethren, I, I love to read history and so forth and I like to look ahead now, it's been 20 years. What is the fruit of Brother Woodruff? And his book was very influential, I understand. The fruit of his work is you have many congregations of the, of the larger metropolitan congregations. They're really in full fellowship with the uh, conservative uh, Christian church. And many of them now are embracing the emerging church movement. They're going, they got tired of all that. They got tired of their brethren. They got tired of even so-called evangelicals. They want something really different. Emerging church movement, brother, brother Daniel can tell us a lot more about that, but it tries to bring together all this Roman Catholicism and Buddhism and New Age religion. Boy, you can learn how to pray better that way and worship better. One hotbed of that is my alma mater, and that's Abilene Christian University. They're, they're, uh, one of, two of their professors have gone to Roman Catholic monastery to learn how to pray. One, Randy Harris, has been called the only Church of Christ monk. He says, he, says it, he talks about contemplative prayer. He says somehow he sometimes finds time to engage in contemplative prayer and goes on retreats where this is the sole activity. He experienced included, his experience included a 40-day silent prayer retreat with hermits at Leb Shemoa House of Prayer in South Texas. 
participation in Jesuit and Franciscan retreats in Trappist monasteries and a Celtic retreat on the island of Lindisfarne. He says, I go where people know things about prayer I don't. He doesn't go to the Bible. Goes to some Roman Catholic mysticism. And this man teaches classes in freshman Bible, undergraduate theology, introduction to philosophy, and advanced preaching at ACU. That's the children of apostasy. That's what the children of apostasy are doing. Colossians 2 verse 18 says, Let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshiping angels, intruding in those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind. That's what this brother has done. Vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind. Brethren, we don't need to follow blind people like that. We'll both fall in the ditch. We need to hold on to the word of God. You know, the prophet Micaiah, when confronted by the prospect of fellowshipping both the evil Ahab and the once righteous king Jehoshaphat, boldly proclaimed, as the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. We need to do the same thing. We don't need any of this other garbage. Thank you very much. Well, I don't know about the only monk, but he's certainly not the only spiritual baboon. There's got seem to be a plethora of those. Something is terribly wrong with people when they will leave the simplicity, Bible teaching, and especially New Testament teaching, to go after all of this particular worthlessness. We thank you, Brother Ron, for presenting that material. I remember when this book came out, I was still in Austin, and Brother James Bales was very much opposed to Woodruff and Hardy and wrote even a book against this book. And, and by the way, it's quite a good book. And of course, Brother Bales was wrong in marriage, divorce, remor uh, remarriage, and he had long been, a uh, uh, number of years, been exposed on that point. But he was right in what he was doing and, and dealing with them, and I thought it was rather humorous. He uh, phoned down that direction in Austin and talked to Brother Roy Deaver. Well, Brother Deaver at that point was trying to get ready to go into the Isthmus of Panama because of Bale's doctrine being taught down there. They were having a big uh, meeting down there to expose that doctrine. And here Brother Bales called Brother Deaver to get him to fight Woodruff. And uh, Brother, Brother Deaver reported, said he, well, Brother Bales, he said, uh, that's all well and good, but I'm trying to get ready right now to go fight something called the Bales Doctrine. <laughs> that's kind of a hodgepodge mess we're in in this day and age. And the more we leave the truth, the more you can expect all sorts and sizes false doctrine as that's been proven now by fact over the last 20 some odd years with all these different kinds of books coming out. Yeah. One thing we must ever keep before us, truth is more important than anything else, yes, even unity. Without the truth of God, there can be no unity as Jesus Christ prayed for it and as Paul commanded in 1 Corinthians 1.10. It's just that simple. We'll stand adjourned for the next 10 minutes, and then we'll come back in for our next meeting. Remember, those of you who have questions, to be sure and write them down in the open forum. Thank you, Brother Ron.